Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. And it is Friday. Uh, it's sometime in the middle of September. I don't even know what day it is because uh, I've just been playing games a lot. I've been staying up late every single night. It's that time of year. All kinds of fun things are coming out, and it's uh, incredibly difficult. Woe is me to keep up with all of this awesome. But speaking of awesome, we've got an incredible show for you today. Our friend Rod Ferguson from The Coalition is in the house yes and we are gonna have a nice uh, post-mortem conversation maybe a little bit spoilery so watch out for that uh, in a little bit we're gonna talk about the launch of Gears 5 which I am so excited about especially because it's an incredible game uh, we're gonna get to that in a bit though first we've got uh, the rundown to get to and this one is uh, dedicated to uh, Eddie Money Rest in peace for all the incredible tunes that you gave us over the years, uh, passed away today, uh, but also to uh, Death to the Dictators. Uh, loved your TV show back in the day, and you're still doing great reviews, Vic. Thank you very much. This rundown is all yours. Uh, you'll soon be able to jump behind the wheel of Mario Kart in real life. Nintendo and Universal Studios have announced that fast rides uh, that are coming to their Super Nintendo World theme park attractions. Speaking with investors, Universal Parks and Resorts Chairman Tom Williams revealed that the first, uh, when the first Nintendo World opens, it will have two rides, one based on uh, Mario Kart and another based on the Yoshi games. The worlds will have other attractions like Nintendo-themed shops, of course, restaurants, and a life-sized interactive version of Peach's Castle. And that's just the first phase, with more rides and attractions coming down the road. The first Super Nintendo World opens in Universal Studios Japan next year. I cannot wait. That's almost like a reason to go to Japan right there. I want to see a real-life Nintendo World. I think this sounds like an incredible idea. Who here has been playing Nintendo games for many, many years and always said, wouldn't that be an amazing theme park? We're finally getting that. It's, it's going to happen. And now it's going to be even more of the theme park wars with what Disney's got going on with Star Wars and Marvel and, and uh, Universal's going to double down with uh, uh, Harry Potter and with, uh, with Nintendo. Great. Incredible. Uh, all right, now when it comes to the fitness genre, Nintendo wants to put a ring on it. Following a teaser earlier this week, Nintendo has announced Ring Fit Adventure, a new title that aims to combine fitness games and adventure games. Players will explore a fantasy world and battle monsters using a leg strap and the stretchy new Ring Con Band, which Nintendo says will make you break a sweat while playing. There will also be mini games similar to Wii Fit and Wii Sports. Those, incidentally, are two of the biggest selling games of all time, so it's clear why Nintendo wants something similar on the Switch. The new controller peripherals could potentially be used for other Switch games in the future, although they can't be used with the upcoming Switch Lite unless you buy an extra pair of detachable Joy-Con. Ring Fit Adventure arrives next month. My kid and I watched this trailer yesterday, all seven and a half minutes of it. The hosts looked a little bit uncomfortable. They looked like they were like super into it um, as they were stretching and doing all of the exercises and stuff, but the uh, the idea seems cool. It seems weird, and it seems like it could be fun. It's clear that Nintendo, um, you know, recognizes that there was a bit of a backlash after the success of Wii Fit and Wii Sports, that people didn't really, uh, they didn't really kind of serve the gaming market as much back after those types of games, and I think that was the idea here, is that these, this title actually is a video game, and it has video game, um, you know, adventure elements in it to keep gamers kind of interested in it. Plus, they'll work, they'll work out a little bit. They'll get a little bit of exercise, which is kind of cool. They stealthily put that in. My kid watched the whole thing like this. <laughs> she, she could not believe her eyes. <laughs> she couldn't. I don't know if anybody has seen this thing, but all kinds of people were exercising and stretching the band, and they're putting the leg strap on. And, and she, at the end of it, she's just like, wow, that is crazy. I can't believe it. Um, but I think it, uh, it could potentially be a huge hit, although the Nintendo line has really been to go and chase after gamers with this generation and less about, um, you know, inclusion and bringing the whole family in and getting uh, grandma to bowl and stuff like that. Um, so we'll see. 
Uh, but I was uh, I was pleasantly surprised. It, it's another one of these crazy ideas from Nintendo that actually could uh, make them a fortune. All right. Now, it looks like HBO really doesn't want to give up the Iron Throne. A second Game of Thrones prequel series is in the works. Deadline and The Hollywood Reporter claim that the network has begun work on a new series that will take place about 300 years before the existing show, chronicling the rise of House, of, House Targaryen, which was recently explored in the Game of Thrones compendium book, Fire and Blood. Author George R. R. Martin is apparently working closely with HBO on the new series, so expect plenty of lore that expands uh, his already vast fantasy realm. The, this new prequel show is on top of another Game of Thrones prequel that's already on the way. That one is set thousands of years earlier, and it has already begun filming. Yeah, clearly this uh, franchise has made HBO mil- probably billions of dollars at this point with all the licensing and all of the, uh, uh, you know, the after sales and the Blu-rays and the DVDs. It's an incredible series. I know the last season was uh, controversial. Not everybody liked it. Not everybody liked uh, the way that the showrunners handled everything. The showrunners... Uh, I think we're ready to move on to do other things like Star Wars. Um, And so uh, we'll see how the new people and the new cast handles this material. Um, But uh, it's awesome that George R.R. Martin is still so closely involved. I think much to the chagrin of all the people that wait for him to finish books. Uh, But I think it's uh, it's pretty rad. And hopefully this series will be um, not only successful, which I think we can kind of all bank on, but also really, really worthwhile. You know, and really, really fun. Kind of like um, uh, Better Call Saul was to Breaking Bad. You know, who expected that show to be as good as it is? We'll find out soon. All right, now EA and BioWare, we're going to end on some sad news here, have apparently put the final nail in the coffin on their online game Anthem. Just six months after the game's troubled launch, EA has quietly dumped it into their vault of free titles for EA Access subscribers. It's rare for a game this new to become one of the free titles, so it could be EA's way of cutting their losses and leaving the game behind. They had originally hoped Anthem would become a massive hit by, uh, b- and be an ongoing service, but several game-breaking bugs and poor reception at launch crippled the game, and it never recovered. For now, EA says there are updates and new DLC drops coming for the game, but it's unclear how long those will last. And, you know, it wasn't just EA and BioWare that wanted it to be a hit. All of us did, too. I don't think there's a, uh, a person watching this right now. I don't think any of you uh, would ever want anything less than, you know, massive success for BioWare. They've delivered so many fantastic games over the years. And I think all of us were expecting uh, after uh, the last Mass Effect title that this was going to be their turnaround. And uh, sadly, it hasn't been that. So, uh Uh, Maybe it is best for this door to close and for the studio and for Electronic Arts to kind of look forward and and, uh, think about what's next. Um, I I know a lot of Anthem players out there, a lot of diehards are probably uh, uh, really bummed out because they're still believers and they're still wanting people to, uh, to get involved in the community. But with news like this, it becomes harder and harder to get excited to do that. All right, you guys, we're going to turn that sad news off, though. Let's, uh, let's move on and take a look back at this day in Everything Cool. Welcome to this day in Everything Cool for September 13th. This day has seen the release of one of the biggest and the biggest video games ever. First up, on September 13th, 1985, Nintendo released Super Mario Brothers on the NES or Famicom in Japan. The character of Mario and his brother Luigi had already appeared in previous Nintendo games like Donkey Kong and the Mario Brothers arcade game, but Super Mario Brothers was something very different. Unlike a single screen arcade game, it was a side scroller, with players traversing left to right from one end of a level to the other with the ability to jump and stomp on their enemies. Nintendo designers should Shigeru Miyamoto and Takashi Tezuka created the game as a way to show off the capabilities of the Famicom and its cartridge system, using the knowledge of the hardware to get the most out of it, and because they really knew what they were doing, the final game only came in at a mere 32 kilobytes. When it was released in Japan, the game became a huge hit and was so big that Nintendo decided to bundle it with the NES for the console's launch in North America a month later. This helped drive interest in the system, establishing Nintendo, the NES, and Mario as the dominant force in the gaming industry. The success The success of Super Mario Bros. and its emphasis on Mario's jumping abilities gave rise to an entirely new genre, the platformer. Mario has since appeared in about 50 million games, but who's counting? 
The next game wasn't quite as big, but it was still a knockout. September 13th, 1993 was a day your local game store said, Get over here! Because that's when the original Mortal Kombat was released on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, as well as the handhelds Game Boy and Game Gear. Mortal Kombat had already been released in arcades the previous year, with creators Ed Boon and John Tobias tasked by their employer Midway to create a more violent and edgy brawler to compete with other games like Street Fighter II. The thing that made Mortal Kombat unique was its fatality system, allowing players to execute their opponents in gloriously bloody fashion. Unfortunately for the home versions, Midway was forced to tone down the violence. On the Genesis, the blood could only be unlocked using a special cheat code, and it was removed altogether from the SNES version. Despite this, the violence in the game still created a huge controversy, and the U.S. House of Representatives even held congressional hearings on video game violence as a result. The controversy surrounding Mortal Kombat directly led to the creation of the ESRB rating system, which is still in use today. Needless to say, the controversy didn't stop Mortal Kombat from becoming a huge success. Ports of the game found their way to the PC and Sega CD a year later, and there have since been more than a dozen sequels or spin-offs. Ladies and gentlemen, we have Rod Ferguson from the Coalition in the house. It is so great to see you. Yes. Uh, first up, my friend. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That's so cool. You guys finished another behemoth, another massive <laughs> boss size video game. Yeah, the team at the Coalition is amazing. They did, I'm so proud of them. They did such a great job, so I'm really happy. That's great. When I watch the credits after the, the campaign, I, I think it's because I've been uh, involved with the External Development Summit the last few years. Yeah. I, we talked on stage one, one year at that, at that event, which yep. is a great event. I've become more aware of all the external teams <laughs> that companies work with, and there were a lot of them that you guys work with. It takes a village. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in order to do AAA at the quality that you want to do AAA at, it's you can't. It's not a one-team gig anymore. You have to do outsourcing and partner development and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's because uh, it's you know like, to get it to that bar. Like for us, like Gears is always meant to be a visual showcase, and, yes. and we always want it to be at the height of execution. And so to do that, it takes a lot of people. How far up the chain is the importance of Gears kind of registered at Microsoft? Like, does Satya Nadella know what this game means to the community? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was I, I just had a one-on-one -on -one with Matt Booty uh, before coming over here, and he and he was relaying to me the story of Satya coming up and congratulating him on a great game. So I'm like, I'll take that. That and is amazing. It. Yeah. So, and then he spoke to the the whole leadership team and talked about um, about Gears Five and what it means to the fans and that kind of stuff. So it's great. I mean, and, and we had when we did the like the gold our gold party at like our gold announced for Gears Four in Vancouver. Yeah. The board of directors were up, so I got to talk. Uh, give a presentation to Bill Gates and such and all that stuff and so Incredible. and it, it was amazing to be able to like talk to them about Gears and I was talking about at that time Gears 4 we had the big Gears Inc. tattoo stuff and they were all looking at each other like there's a Microsoft product that people get tattooed <laughs> on their bodies like what's going on and so it, yeah so it's all the way up to the board of directors they know about it. Do they play the game at that level? That's or? a great question I don't yeah. know that I wasn't asking Bill what his KD was or anything <laughs> like that so uh, I would hope but you know it, they were they were excited they, the funny thing was like after the presentation like the the boards uh, the directors were all coming to me going like I need I want that shirt I need some swag like so it was kind of cool from that perspective I'm sure they get asked by a million people out there <laughs> Do, do, can you hook me up with the game? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You got, it, got any shirts or anything like that? Yeah, so it, it's definitely all the way through. And I think part of that is the elevation of Phil now, too, is sort of, you know, the way that games has been elevated inside of Microsoft. And so it's just, it's fantastic. I mean, and, and the, re the response has been unbelievable in the way that people are talking about the importance of Gears to the new Xbox Game Studios and how we've set a bar for for the for Microsoft and, and for this generation in some respects. And so I, that's great praise and we love it. And that was the mission. When was you, the mission when yeah. you came back <clears throat> it was the mission yeah that's what it, my speech to the team was was like this was the goal like from when i came back in you know january 2014 like to get to like how often do you look at the sixth iteration of a game of a franchise and say this is the best yeah and so it's not very often but that was the goal when i came back in 14 and so now that we've got pop doing great you know we're still working on tactics and and five's response like it and I'm, you know, we're just doing the comics, the novels, and the clothes, and the movie. Like, it, it's just it's really exciting time to be a Gears of War fan. I follow um, Cliff Blazinski on uh, on Twitter, uh -huh. and he's always, you know, thumping his chest and saying he's not getting back into games. <laughs> right. But he saw an ad for Gears Five at a baseball game or something right. like that, <laughs> right. and it all. And I'm I'm curious if you guys had any inclination working on the first Gears where this road would take you. I mean, you clearly knew you had something special there, but did you know it was going to be 
this no. important to games? No, no. I mean, with Gears 1, definitely not. Like, we had no idea what we were building. Like, in the sense that the, the sort of the speech to the team afterwards was the, like, we've got lightning in a bottle here, but we didn't realize. Like, because, you know, we were 24 hours from cutting multiplayer. You know, like, we had a weekend to prove that we could make multiplayer work uh, before cutting it. And, yeah, we were just, they were just, and it was just a lot of hard work. And so the notion of where it went on to where it kind of defines what horde mode, anybody who has a multi-wave against endless enemies, it's all called a horde mode, even though that's our name. And, and there's a bunch of stuff that it helped, I think, set up what third-person shooters can do and, and cover-based shooters. Yes. And yeah. So, and what... What I love about what's the response to five now is that we're sort of pushing the envelope in other ways. We're trying to be, you know, more approachable, more accessible, more inclusive. Uh, we're trying to set a bar for visuals, a bar for sound. Like Forbes just wrote a, a like a multi-page article just about our Dolby Atmos implementation. You know, just there's an, a, an article of like a, over a thousand words about Dolby Atmos alone. They don't talk about anything else but the Dolby Atmos. Well, so. I, I mean, that's that's got to be so rewarding for a veteran like yourself that has come you know, from all different levels of the video game industry and just get, watched it grow and grow right. uh, to be given sort of the, the the tools and the toolbox to be able to implement all of this stuff at the highest level. Yeah, I mean, it's just the quality of the team, right? It's yeah. just the people. That's what I, I talk about is there's one thing about the product. You remember the games you're making, but I, what I remember more is the teams I work with. And, cool. and that's and people are saying like, okay, you've been on and off with Gears for 15 years, like how are you still doing this? Yeah. And a lot of it is just like beyond getting to work on my favorite franchise is the fact that every day I get to come in and work with some of the t most talented people in the industry and learn from them and grow from them. And so it's really exciting from that perspective. So, uh, and the fact that, and Microsoft just gives me enough and the, squ and the studio enough leash to just do what we want to do. People want to write the story. They want to have the story of this overbearing corporate, you know, overseer who tells us to make Game Pass games that have to be this kind of way, or, and they want this story that doesn't exist. And, yeah. and the reality is, is that Phil and Matt say, you know, here's your studio, go make great games, and you go, thank you very much, and off we go. And so they don't tell us what to build, they don't tell us how to build, they don't. We just like they give us like, here's your money, you figure it out, and we're like, great, and that's what we do. I'm curious if uh, you've got artists that are working on the team that are working on Marcus Phoenix's beard, <laughs> and they look at you as a little bit of reference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For Gray, it's a good yeah. reference for Gray. Yeah. No, the funny thing was like the. If you watch the 2018 to 2019 where we shaved him and then unshaved him, <laughs> yeah, it was just it was this funny thing because I was just felt like as you move from game to game, you want change in the characters. Yes. So I was like, okay, so Gears Four had a beard, and now we're putting a beard on JD, and I'm like, I didn't want like everybody to be lumber sexual. I didn't want beards on every <laughs> character, so I'm like, let's let, let's just shave Marcus. We'll shave Marcus. It'll make a difference between four and five. And the response at E3 when everybody saw shaved Marcus was like, what the hell? And I'm yeah. like we may need to think about this again. And so <laughs> I went back and I'm finally, I had to send the mail to the team like, okay, okay, put the beard back on. And everybody was like, yay. Like you could hear a cheer in the room. Like, uh, so I was like, oh, uh, he's, he's still the best character. <laughs> yeah, John he, is amazing. He's incredible Marcus. in the game too. Uh, thanks. It's so fun. Uh, you know, that's one of the things about the game. I talked about it in my review is the, um, I, I don't know, the permanence that you're creating with these characters, mm. which nobody would have predicted with the first Gears. Right. You know, I mean, it was so fun and it was so important, but right. it, it didn't feel like, we'd be sort of caring about the people, right. you know, and getting to know their children and caring about their children. <laughs> right. And I guess that's got to be another reward for you guys as well, right? Yeah, I mean, we tried to pivot away from, you know, like I think what was great about the, at the time in 2005, 2006 was to have these sort of iconic characters that were sort of, I call them archetypes, like, like oh, I get the sports hero, I get the, uh, you know, the anti-hero, I, I understand these archetypes, but when you look at where they were, they were in their 40s, you know, in that, and so they weren't really changing. The world was changing around them, but Marcus's mm. personality doesn't change, Cole's personality doesn't change. So when we went to like Gears of War, the next generation, what I call our, what we're, the saga we're on now, we wanted people young, old enough to fight, so I didn't want to have 12 year olds, I wanted them to be able to go to war. Um, but I wanted them young enough to be able to be transformed by their journey. And that's we, so we set up a, a foundation in four, but five is where you really get to see like JD gets, something happens to JD that yeah. I won't spoil, but something yeah. happens to JD that transforms him. Kate is going through a transformation. And that is great to be able to take these stories. Cause I feel like I look at the original saga, sort of the Tim Burton Batman. Mm -hmm. And I look at the new saga, sort of the Christopher Nolan Batman. Not like, I'm not trying to say we're Christopher Nolan, we're not. Yeah. I'm just saying like from a sensibilities, like one is a little bit over the top, a little bit more 
kind of comic booky, and sure. the other one is trying to be more nuanced and a little bit more contemporary. And that was our goal, at least, to tell different kinds of stories. And so, I think that's what's helped is that in modernizing the characters and modernizing the storytelling is kind of given it some permanence, as opposed to us trying to be 2005, just wooing and grunting our way through right. the next game. You yeah, know? you can't just keep making the same game over and over again. Right. Yes. Uh, but saying that, I know that you have fans that want you to keep making the same game over and over again. Totally. And and what are they? What's the response? What's the reception what kind of feedback are you getting from people it, it's largely positive so yeah. we get a lot because you know with uh, I was going about to give away our trivia one of my trivia questions so I want yeah. so the helper bot we have with you uh, changes up all the gameplay which is great and we have a vehicle now that that allows you to travel these sort of really large levels which um, changes up the gameplay and it's really great and so a lot of people are going like oh this is fresh and modern and I can't believe and surprising and that's one of the things we got a lot of flack at e3 about yeah. where's the campaign I didn't see any campaign but now when we do it in the last week before launch Everybody's like, this is surprising and refreshing. I didn't know this was coming. And you're like, yeah, because if I told it to you six months ago, you'd be bored by now. Yes, right. Right? And so, but there's still those people going like, uh, I didn't ask for this chain and I don't want it. And I'm like, I don't know what to do, dude. Like, I, I mean, there's like, you, you have to live with the, you can, you know, can't make everybody happy. And dude, so. I, I get flack for reviews of games. <laughs> right. I can't imagine what, I was thinking about that today. Like, <laughs> right. people have an opinion about my opinions, which right. I get. They right. totally can have that. Right. I can't imagine, like, the act of creating something and sending it out in the world that's already loved and all of the wealth of opinions right. that you're going to get out. You guys have very thick skin, is what I'm telling you. Yeah, it takes, like, when you put three years in, like, it's a long time. I mean, yeah. and so three years of blood, sweat, and tears on something you're trying to create, and, and you're actually trying to create it for other people. Yeah. And so you put it out there hoping they're going to respond well. And for the most part, we have. Yeah. But the occasional, like, quick to judge on, like, the irrational reaction, you kind of, like, I don't get. And that is the hard part. And you sort of, it's, you're, you the human psyche is to read 10 things and nine are positive and one is negative and you focus on the one negative. Oh, yes. And so you we all do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're going to have to, sort of, you have to temper it and kind of look at where everything is. And plus times have changed when you look at, like I think Gears 5 is the best Gears game, but if you go by like Metacritic, you'll look at, okay, Gears 1 was a whatever, 92, 94, and we're an 85, 86. Don't go by Metacritic. No, exactly. Well, yes. the, and the times have changed. And, yes. like, and the way that scores are aggregated are different and the way that people talk about it are different. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the five point scale drives me crazy because it's either a four, it's either an eight or a 10. <laughs> and no one wants to give you a 10, so it's always an eight. You're like, always an eight, really? Yeah, it's always an eight. Like, God damn. Like, That's why know, we never shifted out of the 10 point. I, yeah. I, I, could, I could never, go down and I remember I used to fight with Tom Russo at uh, Next Gen because we had a partnership with them for a while right and they had a five star thing and we had the 10 and I said can we just double your thing he said no it's five you know Tom right, right no right, it's, right. it's 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 five stars it has to be five so in our reviews back then we'd have the Next Gen score with stars on it yeah well yeah. my favorite are the people who are reviewing stuff they don't like like yeah. if they were to go to me and say okay Rod I need you to do this review on this improvisational jazz album could you give me and I'd be like oh, I wish it was an improvisational jazz three out of ten right like yeah. and so I read these reviews like I've never really liked gears but here's my review and you're like <laughs> okay like I mean, who's that for like who are you writing that for that might be a statement about journalism more than anything <laughs> <laughs> more than anything at all but uh, i mean largely the thing for me is when you look at the user reviews and the feedback we're getting online and from the fans which is who we created for um it's been great and it's been positive and it's been supportive even we had with any game when you have like millions of people show up on day one yep. your server is going to strain your scalability is going to strain and uh, you know hats off to our community team and our, our live ops team to updates every hour and they're working on it and they got through it like that first weekend was bumpy but we got through it and large part of people are just like thankful that hey you're working hard on it and you're keeping us informed and you're working hard which is what we want so it's for the most part the fans are understanding and appreciate which i really the think. xbox needed that marquee exclusive man it's mm -hmm. an it's not just a great game it's not just an awesome achievement but for the console itself it needed that like oh my god i can't play this anywhere else except on the pc but it's you know yeah yeah yeah. no totally and the fact that we try to be like the dolby atmos showcase the 4k 60 showcase and just trying to take it to another place, which I think we've done with the X. I think we're, I think we've pushed the X to like incredible heights. I couldn't believe my eyes. Thanks. Uh, we're going to give away a few of these, by the way. Sweet. Thank you all for coming down. Uh, first one is going out to Corey, who was playing. Uh, come on up hey, here for a second, Corey, because we don't have a camera on you. 
But uh, Corey has uh, an enviable task. Sorry. This is Rod Ferguson. You can look at the camera and say hi. I don't know if you're in focus <laughs> or not. Uh, but but Corey's in the uh, film uh, department here, right? Film production. Film yes. production uh, at VFS. This is yours. Awesome. And after the show, uh, Rod will sign that. So thank, thank you for playing. Thank you. All right. Thank you. It's and not every day you get to play behind uh, the head of the studio. And that he's made playing the well. I've been yeah. watching. He's playing well. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so carry on, my friend. Um, okay. So... Was the idea for launching the game in, in the, the staggered way that you did it partially to handle any hiccups that, was, that were going to happen with the online play or anything like that? No, or? no, no, no. I mean, the, oh, you mean in terms of early access and yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that was just part of having an ultimate edition and having a way. It does help. Yeah. Like, that's one of the things that people don't, like, having that notion of a group of people who come in early, yeah. you sort some stuff out, well, so when the full group shows up, we're ready. We've seen that happen a few times. Yeah. yeah. So it, it does help, but that was not the intent. I mean, the idea that some people want to play on Friday, and, like, traditionally games are released on a Tuesday yep. for, I have no idea. Why I know, that right? Is. But that yeah. notion of ha getting the weekend before is, is appealing, and so that's something we've always done with Ultimate Editions and or the Ultimate Game Pass in mm -hmm. this case too. Um, but it did help a lot. It had, and our, we did a tech test for multiplayer, which helped a lot too. Uh, but it's just like you know, you're getting hundreds of thousands of people in a test, and then you get millions of people on the first day, and and it's so different now that before it was you used to be able to watch it crawl across the country. Like you would do, okay, we're available at midnight. So people would go line up outside the store and wait in line. And so that you would see things start to, oh, 1 a.m. People are coming home from the store. Here comes the gamers. Are you and guys all up? Yeah, exactly. Are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. I bet you are, yeah. yeah totally. <laughs> and so you would watch it crawl across like in, in sort of time zones. And now the fact that it doesn't do, like people can preload it. Yes. People have Game Pass. And so at 12.01 or now 9.01, like a million people go now. Yeah. And you're like, there's no delay. There's no creep. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, what we went from, you know, no players to a million players in three minutes. All of a sudden, like, of course, everything goes for a second and you have to go, oh, shit. And turn on a <laughs> bunch of lights to get it all to come back up or whatever. Right. So it's it's just part of why I think every game goes through that. They're just not ready for that amount of no much no matter how much you test yes. the, the ability to scale services because it's actually not the game like whether if you were to look at what goes from a game to a back-end server in a data center in the middle of the country mm. there's like four different middleware providers and different pieces of software that all be like oh too much scale down oh no the pipes are being used like, that, like and, and you have it's not even within our control like, you know what i mean so it's just it's just funny i've been to the uh, yeah the xbox live uh, space at Microsoft, and right. it's crazy. It's like out of a uh, Doctor Strange Love or something like oh, that. Oh, totally. And with yeah. the, with you know Azure data centers all over the world, like it's like you're, it's crazy. It's like spread out everywhere. But it, it's just in a, a different time, and you just have to be ready for it. But it's it's, it's still great to see it light, light up like that. Awesome. Um, we're gonna take questions for Rod. So if anybody here in the audience has a question for Rod, or if anybody watching uh, on the stream has a question for Rod, all I ask on the stream is go into all caps. So. Uh, you're easier on my eyeballs, okay? Um, and uh, I'll look over here every once in a while. Um, and the, the secret here, some of you have finished the campaign, and Rod and I are playing nice. We're trying not to spoil, spoil too much because a lot of people are jumping into the game for this weekend. Yes. Um, but uh, some really heavy consequential stuff happens in this game. Yeah, I mean, the, it's a two-sided story. It's a story of what Kate is going through as part of learning about her origins and mm -hmm. like what is the family connection to the enemy or the monsters. And then the other side is war comes to Sarah. Like we, at the studio we joked that like Gears 4 is three people lost in the wood finding a monster. Like, and that's kind of what 4 was. So 5 we wanted to be like war returns. And with war comes loss. And so that was something we wanted to make sure we had in the game that as you play there were going to be consequences to what's going on in the, in the game. And I, there's always been uh, you know a, a sort of a, an emotional through line to the gear, like right. you know, Dom losing his wife, and the, just the heaviness of the right. the world around these characters has right. always been there. Yeah. But the tools to show that cinematically have not been at this capacity. No, I mean the quality of a bit of what we can use to do the storytelling. And Greg Mitchell, who's our, our cinematic director, amazing uh, cinematic director, he's been with us since like he worked on Gears One all the way through, and so the person helping to sort of show that story has been the same but the technology and the team around him has been is different yeah and so what you see is sort of realizing what the vision actually is but what i love about gears is it's one of very few franchises that has a breadth within its its tonality of the franchise that in one second we can be very comic book laughy making jokes mm. then we can be sort of fast and furious action blockbuster set piece to i'm crying because i have to euthanize my wife like you know what i mean yeah. like the, and so the notion of having 
a, a franchise that you can kind of almost go anywhere and it still works as long as you sort of ground it in the world is is liberating for one because we can tell any story yep. but it's just really fun because we can go anywhere well i mean this this is what i wanted to talk to you about because as i was playing the game i, I started to recognize somebody that's played all of these games and finished all of these campaigns right. and you know I, i'm not a diehard that it stays with these games forever because i've got to review other things sure. but I, I i've certainly appreciated every experience that i've had with gears with this one i really got the sense that the genres can be started new genres can be introduced into this world a little because you're totally. expanding into uh in the context of the stories that you're telling into a bunch of new different ideas and you did that a bit with four with the with the controlling the robots right and now you've got different types of games you've got a tactical game and you've got the uh, the funko pop game right is there a uh, you know a team at the studio maybe doing a little r d on different ways to approach a gears game uh, yeah, I mean, we always <laughs> we always looking at for uh, you know we're always doing R and D and looking at stuff. I mean, for us, for this one was like the the commander's intent. We call it, like people might say a mission statement or a vision statement, but we're a military game, so we like to use uh, military terminology. So the commander's intent for Gears Five was was challenge expectations. Yeah, because uh, we know that for people were saying like, hey, that's a great Gears game, but it feels a little safe, and we're so we went in going like, okay, how can we challenge expectations? And that was whether through player choice and the things you can do in the game to the way we did marketing where we put multiplayer on stage for the first time at E3 and right. we saved campaign till the very end and right. those sorts of things. And so, yeah, so as we looked at it, we were like, okay, if player choice is one of the ways we can challenge expectations, how do we lean into that? And so things like player initiated combat, which was a big thing about Bioshock Infinite was around let the player start the fight, don't start the fight without them kind of thing. The notion of having a helper bot that can provide you RPG elements that now I can use, my only verb isn't just the end of the bullet on the end of a gun. Now I can go invisible or I can solve all these puzzles with putting up a shield or a proximity bomb and those sorts of things. Or And then the open world elements where it's like, okay, now we have a level that's probably like 50 times bigger than any other Gears level that I need a vehicle to be able to go from point to point to point and now, and handing the keys to the player to control the pace because Usually we're we're very um, we have a lot of pride around pacing, you know, in terms of trying to be a summer blockbuster. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this case, it was like, okay, like if you want, like, my your eyes to bleed, go mission, mission, mission. You can do it. Or if you want to be like, hey, that was really intense. I want to go look around for some stuff, and I want to go do some side missions, or just go look for a story. <laughs> Which is me. <laughs> yeah, well, you can do that, and then the vehicle lets you do that. So it was kind of cool to add flavors of other like uh, an RPG flavor and an open world flavor without trying to become a new genre it was just meant like how can we expand the verbs for gears into new and interesting ways I could feel that okay, and, I, and, and me as a consumer of all of these entertainments wants even more of that okay and I so from me you have all the agency <laughs> to experiment and show me what else you Done. guys got all Noted. Right? Uh, but you mentioned a little helper robot yeah and I think that leads into a question that we're gonna throw out now um, some of you may know the answer to this and some of you may already have the game so play fair and if you've already got the game to put your hand up okay <laughs> exactly but, uh, go ahead so and what ask. is the name of it, it of the helper bot so you choose you choose you're the host okay we've got this guy I'm sorry I don't know your name there that is correct. Go. The answer is Jack. This baby is yours. Batman is going to give you that one. Uh, we'll give it to you afterwards, and, and uh, Rod will uh, sign, sign that one. If you want it, sign. I, I'd want to lower the value of it by <laughs> signing it if you don't want it. Um, okay, we have two more, and, and uh, you can come up with a couple What is more. the name of the vehicle in that you drive in Act 2 and Act 3 of Gears 5? Ooh. Oh, see? No, Dana, Dana, you can't answer. Dana works. Our communications director is like, I know. To you, kid. you have the game, Dana. Oh, but you <laughs> already have the game because you just finished it. So <laughs> all this is telling me is that marketing's not working. <laughs> Our marketing's not working. Uh, what's the name? Okay, so no one knows the answer to the answer is a skiff. Skiff, yep. Uh, which is our wind-powered vehicle that uh, you kind of... Um, sort of wakeboard behind. Uh, what is the new cooperative mode we showed at E3 Oh, that's called? a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Blake, you're disqualified. You can't, you can't answer that. So three-player co-op. You got fancier, but they don't know all the I know, details. I feel like I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and Rich just bought it. Yeah. You got... It is called yeah. Escape. There we go. What's your name? Mike. Mike. Okay, Mike, Mike this one is yours. We have one more. Do you want to save it for a little bit? We'll yeah, let's save it. Okay, let's see if I've got any questions here. Um, uh, Will uh, Rick Savage says, "Will be the last Gears with Marcus Phoenix." 
Uh, is, is, will this be the last Gears with Marcus Phoenix? That's a big. That's a big question. That's a big spoilery type question. Yeah, that's sort of. Yeah. Uh, when my, my so my favorite troll I did over this weekend <laughs> or this week was somebody said, um, I haven't finished the campaign, but I really love Foz, and I can't wait to see Foz in the next game. And then I said. Clearly, you haven't finished the campaign oh, yet. Oh, <laughs> you're cruel. That is awesome. <laughs> so I would use something similar, like maybe it's the last first game with Marcus. We don't know. They're at war, guys. <laughs> exactly. We don't know who lives with or who war, dies. war, there's loss. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> this one's a good one. Um, uh, Leighton JT, is Dom going to be an unlockable character? Is Dom going to be an unlockable? Yeah, Dom, will, Dom, as Carlos is very excited to come back, uh, Carlos Ferro is the voice of Dom. I, I've told him he's coming back and uh, as a multiplayer character. So, yeah, down the road. So one of the things we're doing as we sort of look at our, you know, we're doing these three-month operations. You know, some games will call them seasons, but we're going to be really seeing, you know, new characters, new costumes, new maps, new modes, new tiles. But uh, and I couldn't tell you which operation it's in. I'm sure Dana's already on the, already emailing people like, oh, crap, Rod already re announced Dom. But uh, <laughs> Dom, but yeah, Dom will be a character at some point. <laughs> yes. Can we just get an exclusive? That's yeah, exactly. Awesome. Eat, your, eat it there, Jeff Keeley. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, Gears 5 has a big player decision. Uh, will Gears 6 have. You're going to go spoiler. You well, I don't. I'm. No, there's whatever you're asking me about Gear Six, I can't answer. Okay, we, there's the the, yeah. the future. The Magic Eight Ball says the future is uncertain. Okay, future is uncertain. All right, uh, <laughs> anything is possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, question: What are you, uh, this is from Jamie Andrews? What are your favorite creative processes in making a new Gears game? That's a good question, Jamie. Uh, well, for me, like I have a real personal attachment to the story. Mm -hmm. um, so I work like Tom Bissell, who's an amazing writer. Uh, we have a great uh, franchise narrative lead with M. Bonnie, Jean Ma, uh, and our lead campaign uh, campaign design director, Matt Cersei. And so the four of us coming together to kind of like lay out the spine of the story and then to start working through that. That's my favorite part is kind of coming up because I'm, I'm not a... Like, my trade isn't design, and so I kind of come to it from a slightly weird angle, but I like sort of designing within constraints. And so the monsters, we tend to come up with a story, and the monsters and the weapons tend to fall out of the story. We don't sit around going, like, I need a weapon that does blah, 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 blah. It's more about, hey, we have this story that needs this kind of thing, and they tend to fall out of it. So I like yeah. the, the, so we going in and coming up with, like, what's the story we want to tell and then starting to you know build out that story and finding out who the characters are and then beginning to write for those like that's i love that part of it so you you don't start with like the stunt sequences or the big mm. action boss fights or no, no? i mean we, we think as Part of like, you know, traditionally anyways, when, when the more linear games, one through four, it's kind of like a road movie, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so you're kind of going like, I gotta go from point A to point B. Uh, and that's one of the big things that changed for us for five was the first time we ever did time dilation where we were actually, because every other one has been like, here's 36 hours in right. the life of yes. the squad. Yes. And so this is the first time we've ever done, you know, three weeks later or four months later. Like, and, we've, and so that actually allowed us to change the characters. Like Kate fundamentally changes between act one and act two because there's a four month gap there. Yes. Uh, and so, we do look at like, let's go to cool and interesting places. Like, okay, let's go to a winter wonderland and let's go to a crazy red desert. And because you need to have cool backdrops. So you do think about that. Like, so going to visit the rift worm skeleton, you know, that's part of what we think about in terms of having set pieces and stuff. So that's definitely part of it, but it's not like, we don't start with a, here's all the action set pieces and now write a story. It's really more about what's the story and now is there a cool moments so we can have within it. I wonder, have you ever had a sit down chat with Amy Hennig? On, uh, from, no. from Uncharted? No. Uh, because everybody kind of compares your games, and they have in various ways over the years. It's like Uncharted borrowed a little bit of the cover mechanics and stuff. Sure. And some of the storytelling in Gears feels like it's a tip of the hat to the way that story is told in Uncharted. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, Gear, uh, like people sometimes ask, it changes, but like one of the things for a while has definitely been people ask, like, "What's the game you wish you made?" Mm. Uh, and like Uncharted Two was that for me. Like, and there was Same. just there was some there's certain things that inspire you to a crazy degree. And like Uncharted Two, like it's gonna sound really stupid, and it sticks with me. It's probably the thing I remember most about Uncharted Two, which is really stupid, is the opening cinematic. Uh, they're on a boat, and he moves the cooler. And then when he moves the cooler, he exerts through his dialogue while moving the cooler. Mm. So he does this thing like, hey, da 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 da
oh crap, like the way that the room performance capture is allowing his his movement to tie to his voice, nice. which and we always separate. We've always like one through four mostly have been like we have actors doing motion and we have actors doing voice and so you try to do it as best you can but that moment of it felt so natural and real and so that's one of the things we went into five going okay there's a certain number of these we're going to do pcap for so that we can have that physical contact be reflected in your performance but that moment just like, and it's, like i said like this weirdest thing that that moving the cooler on the boat of uncharted 2 has stuck with me ever since i saw it that is awesome I have a question, actually, and anybody that's been following Gears, and this will be for the last copy of the, uh, of oh, the game. Yeah. Um, what famous actor may or may not be in a huge superhero franchise has just uh, been announced that they're going to be playable in, uh, well, you got one already, going to be playable in Gears 5? What was that? Yeah, you yes, got it. That's nice. Yes, yes, this Clint. one is yours. All right, fantastic. Batista. Dave Bautista, yeah. And you met him? I have. Him? I've directed him. Incredible. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he's awesome. He was really what into What a it. force of nature that dude is, man. Like, when I yeah. saw him in Blade Runner, and I mean, he's incredible in Guardians, but uh, he's just, he's really multifaceted. He is. He's really good. Like, and, and he, he cares a lot about the performance, and mm. he's just really interesting to work with. And so, uh, yeah, it was really cool to, to be able to direct him through, like, okay, this is the kinds of things we're doing. Like, combat chatter is not easy, mm -hmm. in our, and we tend to, like, you have to do anywhere from 800 to 1,000, sort of yell 800 to 1,000 different things as part of becoming a, a multiplayer character in Gears. And, and uh, he took it on like a champ and, and brought his own sort of swagger to it and brought his own attitude, and it was great. That is awesome. And you also worked with uh, Linda Hamilton? Which is like a career highlight. Like, How did that even happen? Well, it just sort of kind of worked out in the sense that they were their movie and our ship day worked somewhat aligned, but also the fact that like I think Sarah is kind of a role model for Kate. She's the you, best. You go from this sort of civilian you know, starts as a civilian and becomes this, you know, powerful hero that is fighting for humanity. And that's kind of what Kate's journey is from outsider to now the soldier who's fighting for humanity. And um, I was nervous, to be honest with you, like, because I've worked with celebrities before that it didn't work out at all. <laughs> like, and, uh, and you feel like, I mean, Minnie Driver was an example. She tweeted, she told people I was never going to tell anybody, but I fired Minnie Driver because yeah. she, she's, a lovely woman and a she fantastic video actress. games. She just doesn't want to yell. And you, if you're gonna, you can't be in a Gears of War game and not uh, yell. I, I interviewed her at Sundance, and she hated video games. Right. She like I told her, we're talking to people that are making video game content or play video games. Do you like? I hate video games. I was like, okay, I guess that's not going in the show. Yeah. Well, and I asked her like, so why are you here? And she's like, oh, my nephews love the game, and so I'm gonna be here for my nephews. And I was like, cool. And I'm like, okay, yell incoming. And no, like she couldn't yell, and so or wow. she didn't want to yell. Wow. And so I was like, sorry, I know you're an Oscar-nominated actress, and we're just a little old, you know. Gear but I'm sorry this isn't working and but so I was nervous with Linda I was like okay you know Linda uh, may not be I doubt she's a you know hardcore gamer which she isn't and so I'm like it's all about attitude and whether you care and she came bouncing in and because uh, she had just done a bunch yes the previous day she had done a bunch of zip lining and shooting and a whole bunch of accent <laughs> sequences so she was all hyped up on adrenaline and she came in and I showed her some videos I showed her the escape trailer and I showed her what it was there are versus trailer and I'm like this is what it's going to be like and this would do and I showed her a picture of what she would look like in the game she immediately thanked me for her how she looked in it because she looked great, great. Uh, and then she got into the booth and and she was a joy like she just wanted to like you know she wanted to deliver the best and she was actually helped us where she was we said like hey every time an actor is on the mic we want you to bring you like you know the character and same thing for Sarah and and uh, so we got to one the only thing she called on was like when we have a we have a section for down but not out when you go down and you're it was like help me is one of the lines and she just said Sarah doesn't ask for help <laughs> like, and so we were like fine and so we wrote to like get over here come get me so it was never like in a passive like help I need help like she's like I don't do that and I'm like that's great that's perfect so that and those are the notes you want yeah totally so y multiplayer is out there are, yep. are, do you guys have data on uh, who's playing what? Are people finishing the campaign before they get into multiplayer, or are lots of people just jump right into horde mode? Uh, it's a little bit of it's a sprinkling. I mean, definitely, the, the, you know, Cliff used to say, "Come for the campaign, stay for the multiplayer," mm -hmm. and we definitely see that. Like, we definitely see people, which is what it makes sense to me anyway. I like knowing the characters context before yes. I play as them. So we're definitely seeing a lot of campaign being played right now. Uh, Horde's being played a lot, but a lot of verses too. Like in. Uh, Arcade has been great, which is like arcade is a mode we created for new Gears players. We're like, okay, the mov movement is not quite so fast. The, the shotgun is not so 
uh, prevalent, and so you can actually have rifle fights. You can and live for more than two seconds. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> and so it's actually taken off. For, uh, and so we've been really, really excited about how Arcade has been uh, received. And how is Escape doing? Because this is the brand new. It's doing new great. One. Like Dana actually did a um, a call. That, what are you guys playing this weekend? Kind of thing that you would do as a communications uh, director. And uh, a lot of Escape came back, which is great. So we're really excited as a new mode, and uh, and we'll have lots more to talk about with that too. Especially because uh, you can build maps for it, which is going to be the great thing. Which is really cool. Yes, I have a question about that too. But okay. uh, the VR grid asks, um, who thought of the uh, the massive mace that you can wield, and did they get a raise? <laughs> Good question, uh, VR grid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the breaker is, yeah, I think the big thing was the execution for the breaker. That was the, like, so Jason Hopkins, who's our, our uh, he's now our director of animation, the, 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 the ability to slam it in and then flip them and throw them, like that was the animation team. That didn't come from me or anybody, the design team. That was, they Bunch went crazy sick, on it. sick, depraved, disgusting yeah, totally. people. <laughs> <laughs> but all of them are that way. But I mean, all the ar executions are that way. Um, but yeah, no, the breaker was great. We wanted to, that was one of the investments we did in Five is we, when we worked with the core gameplay team, they really wanted to take Melee to another another level. The before, like if you go back to Gears 3, it's kind of an elbow. It's just constantly this. Yeah. And, because, and we always sort of try to balance. We didn't want to slap fights where people come together and just go, eh, like yeah. we didn't want that. So we always sort of pulled back on Melee. Yes. And so in this time we actually, with Gears 4, we introduced this close cover combat where you could use your battle, your, your knife. And so in five, we were just like, oh, let's just go all in. And so then we created the, the breaker and the iron pipe, and we just wanted to have this thing that was, it just feels really good and responsive. Fantastic. Chris Byrne says, uh, what is the biggest improvement that you see for the Gears franchise on the next Xbox? And uh, he also says, uh, Gears 5 is the best in the series. Great work. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're not really talking about Scarlet stuff yet. Mm. I mean, I think there's, to me, it's just about when you give I'm, I'm less focused on like, hey, what are the sort of what's the thing you're going to do and more about what's the surprise that's waiting for everybody. You know, and right. I, when you give a piece of hardware that powerful to a bunch of creative people out there in the industry, what, what I'm looking for is the things we're not expecting. What is the surprise we're going to get when we get back? When some people say like, oh, I know how to use this power. I'm going to use it this way. Right. Right. Because, I mean, everybody wants to like the easy thing is like, let's talk about 8K. Let's talk about 120 hertz. Let's talk about reduced load times. And I'm like, yeah, like, but that's like talking about horsepower in a car. I want to tell me about what's the what's the really cool crazy thing you're going to do and right. that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Yeah, and I, I, it is too soon for that, right? Yeah, it it's is. still being developed right now. We totally. don't even really know what that is going to be. I, and honestly, when I played it on the Xbox One X, which this is running off of right now, it looks like a next-gen game. Thanks. You know, and then I played it on the S, and it looks like a current-gen <laughs> game. But you guys did a good job across all of the Xbox stuff, Thanks. but Xbox One X just kicks butt. And I've, I've read that yeah. the PC version is like, state of the art with ray tracing and all kinds of stuff. Well, yeah, and you have an ultra texture pack. So you go into the options and you say, I want ultra and it'll bring down even more assets to make it even, to go even further with it. And that was the big thing for us is when we enhanced Gears 4 for X, like you had to choose, do I want pretty or fast? Like, do I want 4K or do I want 60 frames per second? Yeah. And now for the first time we're doing the campaign in Gears 5 as uh, 60 frames per second, but it's and 4K. So yeah. you don't, you're not making a choice. You're getting, and then, then on top of that with HDR and top of that Dolby Atmos, like it's just like, if you want to convince your significant other to get a better <laughs> multimedia system, Gears 5 is the way to do it. Well, isn't that kind of the console holy grail to get 4K at 60? I mean, we don't have 8K TVs right. e probably for another five years, I would imagine, and proliferation. Right. Do we need a new Xbox is what I'm saying. Uh, I can't answer that. But what I can yeah. say, we always need a new Xbox. I guess I, I so, know. yeah. More power is always better. Yeah. Um, but no, I think we're in the sweet spot. Like, Gears 1 kind of caused people to go buy HD TVs. Like, that was the thing, like... I know that I was part of the, oh, if I want to see this game, I got to go. I think we're hitting with five. I think we're hitting the sweet spot around 4K and HDR. Yeah. Because even my brother, because I was like, I sent my brother the custom X. You're, you're so right. The lighting in Gears 5 was the first time in any game on on a console, right. on my TV, where I went, holy, that's what HDR is. Right. That's and really what it is right, right. there. Yeah. And so yeah. when I, I sent the I sent the custom X to my brother, and, and he was like, oh, but crap, I don't have a 4K HDR TV. And so now it's like, I'm going to go buy a 4K HDR TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's just like, it's it's sort of in the sweet spot where now it's more, and I think Atmos is kind of there. I think a lot of people are getting it through headsets and what have you, but the fact that people are having an Atmos conversation, which was not, we had Atmos support before, but it was kind of a little ahead of its time. And yeah. now I think we're kind of, it's actually a little bit more common. 
and people have it. People and they're it. enjoying it. Like as you read that article is mind blowingly how much they they loved it. This this frame is great. I love it. The, the game is, <laughs> the game is so the much background. a part of the frame. It's <laughs> awesome. So uh, the game is uh, it's on Xbox Game Pass. Yes. So that must mean that millions of new people are playing this thing. Yes. That like weren't even ever playing Gears before. Yeah. And are you sort of responding to that and seeing that? Is that is that a totally? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was one of our big design things going in as we recognize that oh we're going to have millions of people who, who don't have that barrier to entry. Like mm -hmm. as a creator, you want to tear down barriers, right? Yeah. So we we did a bunch of stuff around accessibility and and to allow new players to play and support the adaptive controller and all that kind of stuff. But then it was also just like if you don't have a $60 barrier and you already have your subscription or that you can get a subscription for a buck, like literally you can go spend $2 and play Gears 1 through 5, right? And and so our anthology is, is behind $2. Um, there's a hat for you. And there's a hat. <laughs> um, and so, like, the, the fact that all these people are coming, they don't have that barrier means they can go and play. And so we had to design, like, boot camp. Arcade was for new players. You know, Jack was for new players. Like, there's a bunch of different ways to, to do that. So, yeah, it was, it was, approachability was a big thing for us because of Game Pass. Um, is there not distracting at all that Victor <laughs> throwing stuff out to the crowd while I'm just talking. Think, just think of me as one of those uh, NBA mascots. Yeah, exactly. T-shirt guy. <laughs> 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 um, are, are, what is the run? Can you get, give us a sense of how long you guys have content planned for Gears 5? Like, are we going to be getting new things for two years? Through? Like, uh, how, what are you guys thinking? I mean, it, it, that's hard to say. Like, I know, like, we have a definite... Uh, Games as a service is a thing now. Yeah. And so it'll probably do more with how we think about what's next. And so as we envision what's next, if what's next, depending on how long it takes to make what's next, it'll probably determine how much we support and how long. Because the thing with four is that we were three years after four and we did an esports event and had the highest viewership we had had the entire time. So it, you can see that there's a sustain and a length. Absolutely. And now that we have, for the first time, user generated content with Map Builder, that people can actually make content for the game. Yeah. Um, my hope is that it's five will go even longer than four. I think it will. Okay. I've got uh, one more question here, unless anybody in the crowd has a question for Rod. Okay, go for it. Jason says, uh, do you feel a responsibility uh, as a studio based in Vancouver to kind of represent the city? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's part of who we are, being you know, since a Canadian developer. I'm, believe it or not, I mean, almost sorry, the camera. Sorry, I know. I'm uh, trying not to hit anything. The uh, <laughs> like, I'm Canadian, so I was born in Ottawa, Ontario, and so like the notion of trying to represent is part of why I like I like coming to see Victor. Is like it's part of the one of the things about being in Vancouver is to help kind of represent. The thing that you realize, like when I came, 2014 was the first time I was ever in Vancouver in terms of like staying here to work. And the development community is so tight knit that there's people, all the people in my studio, all know everybody else in every other studio, and it's such a close, you know. Um, collection of people that is it's really interesting and, and the talent that's here is amazing so I always feel like that's like how do we represent you know in terms of the Vancouver and Canada as developers and so it's a big it's a big deal but in terms of being like AAA storytelling that kind of stuff that's more about being who we are as gears more than it is about being Canadian um, I've got one from Sam I am one 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 what are some of the ideas that you have to further advance the gears formula in the future any gameplay changes that you have in mind to evolve. Everybody wants to know what's next. What's six going to yeah, be like? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we always have ideas. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, that was part of the, like, what, let's see what happens with five. You know, that yeah. was the, the, we, some of it is just sort of understanding with RPG elements, what's happened with open world elements, how do people respond? So I think we'll see how people respond to this one and they continue to play. Uh, and then we'll see where we go with that. Awesome. When are we going to see you back here to talk about tactics? And uh, the Funko Pop game. I can talk about Funko now. It's yeah. doing great. Like it's. it's uh, out. Is it out? Already? Oh, it's been out. Oh, it's yeah. out. It's yeah. a mobile game though, right? It's a mobile yes. game. Yeah, yeah, it was out August twentieth. Okay. As when it launched, and it's doing great. We already announced we had over a million players. I got to play this game. I, do. I I've been inundated with all the new. Yeah. No, but they have. We just did a Gears Five launch event, so there's a bunch of like uh, Jack and Kate with the Breaker, which is showing up in Pop if you get to Arena Five, and uh, we'll have some new things to announce around. Uh, I get the. 
Oh, Rod did said this thing too. <laughs> uh, around probably near the end of October, we'll have more stuff to announce. But no, it's going really, really well. We've been really excited. And so tactics, yeah, soonish. I mean, I, I've been telling people, even though I clumped them together at E3 2018, we're trying to kind of give each game its own space. Yes. Um, but tactics is coming great. The game is super fun. And what I love about it is sort of like I call it a reduction in terms of if you take red wine and you reduce it down for you know to make a, a sauce like the concentrated essence of what is Gears of War is what tactics, that idea of fronts and squads working together and flanking and using cover, like everything you think you know about Gears is, is embodied in this turn-based strategy game. Is that born out of like real military strategists playing your game? I've always wondered that about Gears because it's made with a sense of that authenticity. Yeah, uh, I wish I could say like, yeah, we brought in a bunch of consultants to do that <laughs> kind of stuff. And, and we get a lot of like people who respond to us, who who serve and, and, and talk to us about that stuff, but not really. Like we always try to be like close enough. Like it's one of the things I try to manage from a franchise perspective is to be close enough to feel grounded, but not so close that we're doing the five by fives all right. the time and we're not doing the Oscar mics all the time. Yes, yes. And so I try to be like, it's sort of the what what does the average person know about the military instead of like what is authentically military right and so and so that's kind of the line we walk but so we try to be like cover is really important and you need to be in cover and that's kind of you know but we don't do like here's how you leapfrog and all that kind of stuff right we don't we're not doing those sort of and then every tactics. once in a while a thing with giant tentacles will come out and <laughs> grab you exactly. and eat you and put you inside yeah, totally yeah. They yes know, they deal with that all the time <laughs> rod ferguson he is the best, is he not? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. On the success of Gears 5, and uh, we'll see you again soon, and, and uh, much love and uh, some sleep to all of your colleagues at the Coalition. Much appreciated. Thank you all very right. much. Thank you, Rod. All right, I've got uh, an early look at uh, the new Legend of Zelda game. It's a preview of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. Let's take a look. I found my favorite local park to talk a little bit about my first thoughts on The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening for the Nintendo Switch. This is, of course, the remake of the Game Boy Classic, one that I played and loved way back in the day, and it is a very surreal thing to play this game again with the haze of memories of playing that Game Boy Classic and running into people and doing different objectives and getting into dungeons that feel vaguely familiar, but of course everything has been beautiful for the Switch and everything looks very toy-like or puppet-like. Gorgeous, gorgeous visuals and a great concept on how to update a classic but still keep it connected to its roots. <laughs> Now, I can't talk about my entire playtime with this game. I'm still playing it. I'll have a review next week, but I can talk about the first few dungeons in Link's Awakening, and I can talk about everything up to a, a certain point where you get to this uh, very special, memorable village. It's adorable as hell, first of all. That's the first thing that washes over you as you're jumping into this world. <laughs> Of course, Link has to wake up and do some chores. One of them find a sword, and then basically what you're doing is you're running around from character to character, and they're giving you little hints, or they're sending you off on quests that will help you obtain items that will help you unlock further dungeons and explore more of the area. <laughs> I've had a big smile on my face as I've been playing through these dungeons, getting into battles with different enemy creatures, which might be pigs with spears or shields and swords. You might be fighting little bugs that might creep and crawl at you. You might be fighting these big plants that are spitting all kinds of venom and poison at you. You may be enlisting the help of other characters that are going to help you defeat these obstructions and get to those dungeons in some really interesting different ways. And you're going to hear great music kind of permeating, you know, echoing from the voices of characters like Marion, but also just in the soundtrack of the game. It's just wonderful. <laughs> I love the interactions with the town folk that you get to meet kind of right off the bat in Mabe Village. You run into all of these kids that are part of this family, and the father at one point says to you, I'm going to get lost later, so please come into the mountains and try to find me, which I thought was just so point blank and clever and fun. Ah. The kids are also very aware that they are kids, so they'll give you helpful hints and tips and suggestions, and then they'll say, but what do I know? I'm just a kid. So there's this, you know, kind of self-aware charm that has echoed through the ages because that stuff was there originally, but it's just so clever and 
heartwarming and enjoyable to play again in 2019. The map isn't massive in the game because it was of course made for a Game Boy way back in the day and there were memory limitations but still it was incredibly impressive to jump into that world back then and I would argue that it's incredibly impressive to jump into this stylized version of that world in 2019. It's perhaps not as transcendent as jumping into the shoes of Link in something like Breath of the Wild where it feels a little bit more one-to-one -one and you're lost in the scale of the immersion. This one you're always kind of aware of the intelligence of the original creators and game developers and also the people that have modernized everything as well because there's a constant tip of the hat to classic game design and classic Zelda design. <laughs> you enter into these dungeons and it's all about having the right tools for the job and using them at the right time. <laughs> You'll find that the boss battles, at least initially, aren't that difficult. It's more about sort of unlocking the puzzle of the traversal of how you get to that nightmare key and how you finally get into battle the big boss. And then you reap the rewards, which in this case are a bunch of musical instruments, which you're trying to collect to play music for a certain specific big boss character. I'm trying not to get too deep into the woods here with story details because I want this to be a fresh experience for people out there. There's tons of people, I mean this is why Nintendo's doing this, there are tons of people that have never played this on the Game Boy or any of its uh, emulated ports over the years and this is going to be the first time for them and much like Metroid Samus Returns a couple years ago now for the 3DS, this is a very worthwhile exercise. The idea of porting classic games with a new veneer and some new style and some new elements like the ability to to create your own little dungeons to test out. It makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of generations of gamers that love Zelda, love this franchise, but perhaps haven't jumped into every single one of them. It's hard not to want a whole bunch of other ports, though, when you play this. It's hard not to say, well, why couldn't you just do this for a lot of other Game Boy games? And there's lots of Zelda games that came out that could benefit from some retooling and a fresh coat of paint like this. The stylish look kind of stands apart here, and that's one of the things that sort of warms your heart and makes you gravitate towards this. <laughs> the controls are a little bit different because you've got that sort of isometric remove, your overhead. I mean, it's familiar to people that have played the old 2D Zeldas and stuff, but it's very different from playing something like Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Odyssey, or I've just come off of Astral Chain. So you're kind of removed, and it's like you're almost pulling the strings of the puppet. <laughs> The game was designed on a grid originally, and this is kind of a squishy connection to that grid base, but you could use the analog thumbstick, so sometimes the diagonals will feel a little bit weird, particularly when you're aiming with projectile weaponry and stuff. It's not so, you can play with the D-pad to kind of make yourself feel like you're playing back in the day. At least I am, I'm, I'm usually on the analog controller on my Joy-Con or on the Pro Controller. And I've been getting used to it, it's not a big problem at all, but it's definitely a different feeling type of experience. But I think that's also what Nintendo saw as the opportunity and what they were going for here. There's great value in this kind of design and that is expressly underlined as you play through this really, really clever game. I've got more to play, I've got more to say, but my heart has been suitably warmed by this very, very beautiful, loving homage to the games of yesteryear and Zelda as a franchise in particular. It looks beautiful, the dungeon mechanics are a lot of fun, and the characters that you meet are gonna put a big, big fat smile on your face. Yeah, so the plan is to uh, review The Legend of Zelda uh, Link's Awakening with Johnny Millennium from the Happy Console Gamer next week. Um, so watch for that. I've uh, been having a lot of fun playing that game, and my kid has really been enjoying that as well. Uh, we had planned to get to NHL 20 to give you guys a uh, review, and we're, we were going to play it a little bit and Let's Play and Chat. And, of course, we've run a bit long because we had a fantastic guest. Once again, our, our round of applause for Rod Ferguson and everybody at the Coalition. Um, I do want to say, though, and, and, and Paul Adamson, you're so correct, uh, NHL 20 is kind of like our uh, Matt Damon on the Jimmy Kimmel show. <laughs> Sorry, we ran out of time. Uh, but, no, NHL 20 has been a blast. We had William Ho on the show, Will Ho from uh, EA Canada on talking about it a, a couple of days ago. Watch that interview if you haven't. He gave us tons of info. I have been playing the game, uh, not nonstop because there's other games that are out there right now, but a lot, and I've been having a lot of fun with it. It is uh, 
a beautiful, beautiful title, and so much of it is about the feel. Uh, so there's a little encapsulated um, taste of what I'll be talking about on Monday when we get deeper into NHL 20. That's going to do it for our episode today, but we've got uh, content coming up through the weekend, so make sure that you subscribe to the channel uh, and make sure you like the content if you uh, if you can hit the little like button and uh, get, hit the bell for the notifications. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend and play forever. Thank <laughs> you.